Energy and Environment Committee meeting. I'm Councilwoman Jan Perry, and we are in room 1050. Before we get into the agenda, I believe we have some continuances. Yes. Uh, which, Mr. CLA, which one is? Yes, Madam Chair, Rafi over here with the CLA's office. We'd like to, just to make housekeeping matters uh, run along a little smoothly, uh, receive and file number two. Okay. In as much as EAD uh, commission has been dissolved. Okay. Item number three, uh, approve on consent. All right, that'll be without objection. And item number four, continue uh, at the request of the Department of Planning and Department of Water and Power for now. And uh, that would leave you with items one and five. I'd like to uh, hear item number five first, if you like. Uh, um, why don't we get five out of the way? Because it seems like that one might not take too long. Am I no, correct? It won't take All right, great. All right, let's go to number five. CO report relative substitution extension of wastewater system debt program credit facilities. We have staff from CAO. Good morning, Sarai Baga from the CAO's office. Okay. The CAO report before you uh, recommends authority to execute credit facilities for the wastewater, de uh, wastewater system debt program. For the commercial paper program, we've negotiated lines of credit with State Street, Wells Fargo, and Calsters for a total of 300 million. And for the series 2008, which is the variable rate debt, in the wastewater program. Uh, we've negotiated letters of credit with Bank of America and JP Morgan for 444 million. Uh, the fees have gone up. For the CP program, we were previously paying 12.5 basis points. And we're, uh, the fees that are being negotiated now are at 80 basis points. For the series 2008, we were at 55 basis points, and it's going up to about 85 basis points. Um, I just want to ask you a question. So the annual cost of the wastewater system debt program has increased, and just I'm just doing some rough numbers here. I'm not sure if this is accurate, but it looks like a 100% increase in cost, roughly, or a significant increase. It's in a significant cost. increase in it. Do you know what the percentage is, the range? Well, I, I don't have that calculated. Sorry. Do you have a range? Uh, well, for the CP program, it's gone up about six times, 600%. Okay, and then? For a variable, it's gone up about, uh, probably about 50%. Do you know what, what the justification is for the increased costs? For the CP program, the lines of credit that we had then were negotiated in 2005, mm -hmm. and those were based on rates that were typical for the market at that time. For the series 2008, we negotiated those rates in 2008, which is when the market started going sideways a little bit. So we started at 55 basis points, and now that credit is more difficult <laughs> to obtain, the 80 basis point reflects the current market conditions. Um, is there no better way to um, find better rates, more competitive rates? We actually negotiated them down from where they were originally starting at. So we've attempted to negotiate them as, as best we can, and this is really where the market is right now for credit. Um, how do I, I, I don't know, how do I, how do I know that? I mean, how do I? I can tell you in comparison, the I, Mikla CP program is paying. No, I'm, ask, I'm asking another question. What um, documentation can you put on the record to show that your search was dispositive of what the market had to offer, you know, like when we do competitive bids, you know, get three bids and line them up and see how they compare. I'm, I'm looking more for something that I can put on the record to show that uh, the city did do an exhaustive search to find the most um, advantageous rates. In terms of process for the commercial paper program, we originally had uh, West LB as one of the providers, and they sent us a termination notice. They wanted to terminate the agreement with us. The other two banks were willing to continue, so they brought in the third bank, which was Wells Fargo as a replacement. Uh, no, I have an idea. Why don't we do this? Because this might, this might be um, more helpful. Um, if I can ask the CLA to work with you, and then we can just bring this back next week uh, with um, some sort of um, just in a quick analysis uh, indicating that uh, this is the highest and best, uh, not the highest, but the, 
the best rate the city could obtain at, the, at whatever given time that we sought it. And this was the summation of the process that we went through uh, to make sure that we had uh, been exhaustive in uh, seeking the best rate. Madam Chair, we could do that. However, I think there's a deadline that they're trying to meet. Can we perhaps work with them and provide that information yeah. in council? Yeah, that's fine. I don't know fine. what your deadline is. Uh, is well, we were hoping to have this heard Friday. Is council. this a deadline or is this just a hope? Tell me. It's which a deadline. The credit facilities expire at the end of June. Okay, what's the date of Friday? The date Friday is the uh, 19th? 18th. 19th. Okay, and then when's our next meeting? The 22nd. Well, it might be better for you if we just get this done in committee so by the time it gets to council, maybe we can do it on consent. If we start going over it in council, then you know, you're going to be reviewed by 14 other people. So which do you prefer? The okay. next committee then. Okay. All right. Let's, okay. Get, let's get it done by then and then okay. when it goes to council, we may be able to do it on a consent calendar. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. Let's go to one. Item number one relates to DWP reports uh, relative to the proposed fiscal 2010-11 budget as well as our long-term strategic plan. Um, I believe we still wait for Mr. Butner unless we can have somebody want to start for him. him. Okay. Good morning, Madam, Madam Chair. This is Aaron Benjamin, Senior Assistant General Manager, Power. So okay. we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we, we did present this plan to our commission uh, yesterday, and we'll just go through, and, and if there's any questions, we can answer in, de in the details. Um, why don't you do a summary, and uh, we're probably going to hold it in committee anyway. Pull the mic back just a little bit. Sure. Okay. Just uh, the summary of, of the, uh, the strategic plan is basically prioritizing for the next year or so, and uh, plus the, the 10 years looking forward on what the issues are, the major issues for both water and power, as far as uh, the reliability of the infrastructure, some of the regulatory compliance issues that we have in front of us, you know, to comply with, and the uh, uh, when it comes to a reduction of the CO2 emissions and the footprint of the department for uh, uh, emissions, uh, where where we think we're going to be, and the investments that we look forward uh, to do in the uh, renewable energy. Uh, and, and some of the other resources that we have to put in place in order for us to make the switch. So the strategic planning uh, kind of covered in, uh, in, in, a, in a very uh, high level on, on some of these issues and what the department is going to be doing as far as the, uh, the uh, source of income and the assumptions that were put in into our budget as far as the uh, uh, rate increases or any other source of uh, uh, asset reutilization that needs to happen in order for us to meet these goals. So on page five, it kind of outlines some of these uh, uh, framework of what uh, asset redeployment issues that we have in front of us, which includes uh, some uh, natural gas reserves that we own on redeploying those, um, making our working capital uh, more of an in line with our uh, priorities, uh, some real estate uh, that we we want to divest uh, and uh, bring income from there, and then uh, lastly on that sheet is the um, the divestiture of the Navajo generating station, which is about 21 percent owned by the city, that uh, we need to do to get into uh, other assets. On page six, in general, uh, the, the looking at the budget itself, uh, the program year kind of gives us an, an outlook of what the expense and the capital investments are going to be, both in infrastructure and regulatory compliance. This, do, this does not include the, uh, some of the issues that we will discuss in a little bit more detail on the regulatory compliance when it comes to in-basin generation on the one through cooling and some of the air uh, resource uh, uh, compliance issues that we have to uh, meet in order for, to repower our power plants uh, in basin. On page seven, uh, we have uh, specific uh, numbers for our, uh, you know, expenses and capital investments that we're going to do in, in 10, 11 fiscal year, about 1.5 billion uh, investments in the next 10 years based on uh, some of the uh, the uh, projections that we have about 18 billion dollar on uh, 
both uh, Kronosius, Mr. Butner. Good morning. Sorry. I'm going to slide it on. We're on page seven. Yeah. Can I go back just a sec? I don't know yeah. how you covered, but I think um, page five is really central to the discussion. Uh, and I think it's just worth uh, reiterating a few things if we didn't discuss them already. And I apologize if I'm going over ground we've trod already. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in, in the power side of our plan, uh, there will be no further rate action this year other than what was passed by the Commission of the UAP and approved by Council in April of this year. In looking forward, what we're going to do is carefully look at all of the assets the department has, and assets to me represent past rates we've collected and saved. So these are ratepayers' monies that exist at DWP. We have natural gas assets we own in Wyoming. We don't need to be in the oil and gas production business. If this were an investor-owned utility, our regulators would tell us tell us what your fuel costs this year and your customers should pay, but you shouldn't be in the business of owning natural gas in Wyoming. We can re redeploy those investments elsewhere. Working capital is a proxy for all the reserves on the balance sheet. Uh, I've heard uh, your questions, uh, Ms. Councilwoman, on, on the notion of debt trust funds and all these other euphemisms that the department has. Uh, this is a proxy for using the cash we have more effectively. Uh, so $130 million is a start. My goal for the year is more than that. And if you, what, what I would like in the way the department has used its balance sheet with all of its different terminology uh, is my grandmother used to put a little money in the cookie jar, some money under the mattress. She'd bury some out back. Uh, and each one was separate and special, but she never added them all up. So we're going through the process of seeing what our liquidity needs really are in the business. And I think we can meaningfully uh, <coughs> use the working capital we have wiser. Uh, that includes the debt re reduction trust fund, that includes unrestricted cash, and that includes other restricted balances that we have on the balance sheet. And we'd be delighted to give you a more detailed report on this as we get our work done. Uh, the real estate in Van Nuys is the symptom for how, again, we use capital wisely in the business. This is a portion, this is the power portion of a project that's intended to house our new computer information systems. You've heard me speak of the need for a smarter bill and the investments we're making to do that. Uh, this is the 70%, so it's a $20 million project. Rather than go down the path as the department had planned to build yet another building, we're going to rent a perfectly fine building down the street and save $20 million in cash by doing that. Uh, the Navajo power stake, uh, as we'll note and go through, our strategies are to reduce the carbon we emit, a meaningful portion of that, include, and fly ash as well and other toxic pollutants come from coal we burn. Uh, we will go down the path and seek our commission's approval to actually sell our stake in that and redeploy the proceeds in other cleaner forms of fuel. In terms of the investments we'll continue to make, uh, we'll increase our reliability investments. That's the centerpiece of what we have to do as a department. Uh, we will increase our efficiency investments about 50%. This is where we and our customers both save money in the long term by doing that. We'll maintain the approach we've taken to renewables and put it on a more consistent path. I liken this to taking $10 out of a paycheck. If you do it for long enough, in 10 years you look back, you'll have quite some savings. If you look each week, uh, it's hard to find where the $10 went. And then I mentioned the John Farrar building. Uh, this is... There are no sacred cows in this environment. We have to look again where we have savings. It's an iconic building. It's important to downtown. I'm not suggesting that we abandon uh, our position and role in the community, but rather we look at where we have savings. And if it ultimately comes down to tough choices, I want to make sure that this council, uh, as well as all of our ratepayers, are informed on the choices we'll need to make uh, as to whether we husband the cash, in effect, in the form of a building, or whether we invest that in a reliable system uh, or safer, cleaner energy. Just, just so you know, in the past, the city's dealt with asset sale issues, and uh, a couple of things you should know is that any disposition of an asset obviously has to go through a competitive process, and uh, the, I think the issue that would arise from that is the possibility of using one-time money to pay for ongoing cost matters, and uh, what policy approach that we uh, would take uh, in approaching this issue as a deliberative body, um, 
So uh, yeah, no, I, I yeah. concur with that, and I think yeah. what I'm trying to do is help identify the issues we should deliberate on, mm -hmm. and we certainly shouldn't use that to pay overhead costs. That would be a mistake. But if we're making a generational shift in our infrastructure or the source of where we secure our power from, uh, it's certainly something we should look at because I would, I personally recommend doing that instead of raising rates. And we're going to be faced with tough choices in this department. And yeah, I know it's going to be an either or situation. I anticipated that, but I, I want to jump back to the debt reduction trust fund mm -hmm. as an option for defer deferring rate actions. And I want to keep plumbing that issue or yeah, delving it, it, into where, that. Where I'm using the euphemism working capital that's a little yeah. broader than just the debt reduction right. trust fund, right. but it's our intention to take money out of the debt reduction trust fund as well as other sources on the balance sheet to generate cash in avoiding going through our rate payers. So I think you and I are actually saying the same thing, perhaps just using different euphemisms. Yeah, and I want to make sure that for us, so as we speak publicly about it, that we make we identify each category in which money may be pulled so that those people who are listing the public and the rate payers really, really clearly understand where it's coming from. Because even when we revise the bill format, that kind of information won't be there. Yeah, no, I, I agree yeah. with you. And I, I think what we're working on is a very specific plan. We'll come back and show you where the working capital comes from, how much comes from the debt reduction trust fund, okay. how much comes from other little hidey holes to make sure that our rate payers understand. Uh, if we can jump back to where you were, I'm sorry, on page 7, uh, the centerpiece of what we do in power is provide reliable power. You know, less than a decade ago, the surrounding communities faced brownouts and blackouts, which we did not, and we must continue to invest in reliable infrastructure. This is one of those areas where it's very easy in any particular year to defer something. You do it for three or four years, and all of a sudden you have a big problem. So you'll see in our budget, again, consistent spending in this area increasing above the rate of inflation to make sure that we take care of this. This is not optional. On regulatory compliance, uh, I've tried to put the big buckets, uh, and I think one of the reasons we've presented in this way is to make sure our rate payers and constituents understand regulatory compliance, this isn't going to the DMV and getting a new driver's license. We actually spend meaningful sums of monies, and let me talk about the big components of that. On air quality, we're going to spend $274 million this year to repower the Haines facility in Basin. This is owing to an agreement we entered into 2003. So that we're spending the money is not a surprise. Uh, it's been budgeted for. The engineers have done their work. And to remain in compliance with that agreement, we need to make this investment. Once through cooling, the use of water to cool our turbines, we've spoken of before in this committee. Uh, that's the need, the physics need to cool our turbines. There's nothing that's 100% efficient. Uh, these State Water Board actions have been underway for several years. Uh, hopefully they've been discussed here before. I'm sure they have. Based on the latest set of rulings issued by the State Water Board, we estimate our costs could increase an additional $2 billion. That's money that would ultimately have to be borne by our ratepayers or found elsewhere. Uh, the, the final policy has not yet been enacted, so we're working very closely with the State Water Board and the governor and his staff. Uh, we will need help from you and council as well because we should speak as one voice. We are all in favor of mitigating the impacts our system makes on the environment, including the use of ocean water, but we have to do it balancing the costs and uh, uh, factors that our ratepayers can afford. So we'll be presenting you with a precise report on once through cooling sometime in the next couple of weeks, and I hope we have a chance to discuss that. Greenhouse gas and AB32, there, there are several components to this. One is reducing the carbon we emit, and we'll talk about our coal strategy portion of that in a moment. There is also the progression in the renewable investing area, and you'll hear me say consistent and sustainable. I think that's the watchword, and that's the way we should be approaching that. Last, I mentioned the Castaic power plant relicensing, because, again, a relicensing sounds like uh, replacing your driver's license. It's actually a federal process we go through, and by the time all of our constituent communities around it, some of which are not Angelinos, uh, weigh in, we will probably spend close to a half a billion dollars to repermit something. So it's big money. It's something that should be on the uh, on the agenda and and drawn to your attention. So to make sure again we speak as one voice and we can manage our costs there carefully. Uh, when we talk about our supply, page nine. Let me first identify a few of the parameters that we are working with. First is we have to draw about 40 percent of our power within our grid, meaning in the basin. It can dip a little below that if our neighbors help us out, but the physics require us to take 40 percent in basin. We can't just dream 
uh, to take 100% of our power from somewhere far away in the desert uh, and not have anything near where we live. It doesn't work like that. The physics won't allow it. So when we're asked, for instance, about once through cooling, why do we have to reinvest the money in these generating stations near the ocean, the answer is we don't have a choice. We need reliable base load which comes close to where our customers are. That's just the physics of the system. On the supply of coal, <coughs> comes from two main areas. Uh, Navajo and Intermountain Power. Navajo is the project we intend to exit from. Uh, we have a legally binding agreement to buy that power. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're not allowed to renew uh, our agreements there, and we intend to sell our portion and replace this with other stable base supply. We will be, again be formally presenting a proposal to our commission uh, to take action uh, of that consequence. Um, I, obviously, there's some environmental be and benefits to doing this, but. Have you done an analysis yet on the impact uh, this sale would have on the department's power reliability? Yes, uh, and we'll be presenting that when we seek formal approval. We're going to have to replace that with other stable base power. Again, our system to remain in equilibrium has to have stable sources, and coal is the most stable source of power we consume today. Now, so. as you progress through the sale, will you have the answer to the, the companion piece? Yes, we have to. We, you can't sell one without understanding how you're going to replace it. So it's a, it's a two-part deal. And then uh, when, what time frame are you looking at? I, I think we'll pre be presenting something to our commission in the next month or two uh, as we refine our numbers and develop the concrete alternatives. Uh, and at that time, we'd be delighted to share it with this uh, commission and as well. And they would be, uh, when you look at concrete alternatives, would they be alternatives that are uh, renewable alternatives or just uh, well it's, it's going to have to be base load so it's more likely to be gas than renewables although a portion of it could be re from renewable energy but we need base load uh, and renewable energy are not base load okay. intermountain power uh, is the single biggest source of power we draw today this is the facility in utah we are a customer uh, the utah municipalities own the facility and we have a legally, legally a binding agreement to purchase power from that until 2027. We could not sell the power elsewhere. Uh, so right now, we and they are partners. It's a good working partnership, and we are actively engaged with them, uh, developing strategies to think about how we reduce the carbon emit. It could, it could come from carbon capture strategies. Uh, we have fly ash issues, which may be looming uh, in the way they deal with the fly ash today that may no longer be in compliance in the future. So we and they are in partnerly discussions about that, and we expect during the course of this year, by the end of the year, to make a concrete recommendation again to our commission, which we'll share with this uh, body on what we can do there. Uh, again, that's stable base load, so any alternative has to either replace it or revise that to make sure that we have the same stable base load. Uh, that's a longer set of discussions. Uh, they are our partners. They're good partners, uh, and Arm and I and others were out there actually just last week uh, continuing those discussions. On, re on renewables, uh, again, the watchword for me is consistent and sustainable. Uh, the technologies will continue to get better. Uh, we expect over time, uh, as the true cost of carbon fuels, uh, both through regulation and environmental uh, damage becomes known, those will become more expensive. Uh, probably the regulators will make them more expensive. But at the same time, on renewables, we have to go at it slowly and carefully. I just want to ask you some, for a clarification. Yes. In the power plan portion, I think it mentions maintaining the renewable portfolio standard at uh, $350 million. We're going to maintain investment okay. in the budget we provided for that, plus an additional $100 million of capital investment, meaning new projects. Now, that the Council's decision on the ECAP proposal uh, also added language about controlling the cost of renewable expenditures. Now, this is my opinion, the approach amounts to conducting um, kind of an end run around the council action in order to finance renewable projects. Now, the full objective of the ECAP proposal was for the department to, main, to obtain uh, 2.7 kilowatt hours in the ECAP over the course of a year in order to add $500 million to an ECAP budget. So we gave DWP about $144 million. Now, from my perspective, it looks like the department found a way to get the rest. Um, well, let me, let me comment a little bit because uh, 
if you wish, I could jump ahead, but what we are going to be doing uh, is adopting a simplified rate structure on the power side, so everything, uh, including our renewable investments, will come to our commission and will come to this uh, council, if you wish, for discretionary approval? Yeah, I think we should. I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, again, let me go back to it looks like the department found another way to get the rest. And again, I like to do everything on the record uh, because as we move forward on our IG proposal, our ratepayer proposal, and our charter reforms, um, the objective is to build confidence of the ratepayer back into this uh, relationship. Um, the uh, IRP for renewables, I think, is the conduit through which we achieve our mutually agreed upon objectives here. And I think that it's important for us to conduct the IRP for renewables first before we conduct a finance plan for supporting the IRP because, again, it's the consensus building. Uh, you know, I know it's kind of tedious and, and, and boring and you know all that but you know unfortunately you know we are a public entity for better or for worse and you know that's what we owe to the ratepayers and the taxpayers and the constituents is this this process that we go through in a public manner uh, to not only allow everyone within our city family to have input but opportunity for the ratepayers and, and the public to comment and so you know I'm obliged to share that with you uh, as sure, part of the dynamic yeah, no, no, uh, sort of shaping I, I, Again, I, I think uh, the more public comment, the better. If we could go ahead and do this out of order. Let me just go to page 31 because yeah, that's fine. if there are two important things I want to make sure to leave behind here today. One is what are the priorities the department faces? Uh, and the second is how do we come up with a rate structure that allows all of our constituents, uh, not just the city hall constituents, to weigh in. Uh, page 31. Today we have about half our rates are what would be called base rate. The other half are the form of all these different various adjustments, ECAF, RCAF, and everything else, most of which our customers don't understand and make it very difficult both to have an open dialogue with council mm. uh, and for the department to consistently plan its investments. Most investor-owned utilities have a several-year rate horizon. That's the basis on which uh, renewable investments, for instance, should be uh, made or not made. Uh, it's the basis on which you look at a repowering of a Haynes because we've known it since 2003. It's not a surprise. So our proposed rate structure, which we will be bringing to our commission and then ultimately to you um, to look at, is to say, okay, everything should be in the base rate. There are no secrets here. You should have a look at every aspect of our spending. We should give the department visibility so it can plan sensibly and not run around like a chicken with its head cut off. We should give that same forward look to council so the important issues, the big components of spending come here uh, and you as well as all of our constituents have a chance to weigh in. And the only thing we should pass through uncapped is fuel. Fuel goes up, goes down. We should have an appropriate hedging policy to make sure we don't face uh, violent price spikes. But everything else should be approved as part of a base rate. So we should not be passing through renewable investments. We should not be passing through reliability investments because that's a core mission day to day within the department. Give them a set of resources, no more, no less, and ask them to go out and execute according to the guidelines that you set. So simplification is not just easier communication, but it also, I think, for a body like this, allows you to say, okay, it's all on the table. Uh, we're not going to talk one day about left hand and the next day about right hand and the next day about Japan's pocket. Let's put it all on the table. And that will be our proposal, uh, and hopefully we can engage on that. And that, that ties back to very much where you find resources uh, and agreeing on a set of priorities because it will all be in the base rate. So we'll never have a discussion in the public where people are surprised by one component of it uh, or there is overspending against any component because it can't happen. This base rate is a closed system. If the money's there and the guidance has been given to the department where to spend it, it will execute. If the money's not there, it can't spend the money or make commitments. Uh, it doesn't have the money to pay for. Okay, and then just, just for clarification, again, mm -hmm. my point about the IRP as being the, the conduit through which all this flows, mm -hmm. and I, I believe that that's something that should be uh, a primary action before we uh, create the finance plan to support that. Um, you want to jump back to... Uh, Yep, let's, let's jump back to uh, 
page 11. So on, on the re renewable investments, as I said, we will consider projects like Milford. Milford is strategic in that it is adjacent to our transmission line. So it's cost effective relative to other forms of renewable investment. We'll continue to pursue solar in basin. We will consider a feed in tariff. Again, we're not going to jump in uh, feet first into shallow water. As a next step, I've met with the Council General of Germany and we've invited a senior delegation of German utility executives. Germany is the world leader in feed-in tariff and let's learn what went right and what went wrong and uh, in an open forum like this, we can certainly meet with those folks and, and learn from them before we jump in and adapt our... I think actually that would be something that would be really smart to do, to do it in an open forum. You could, uh, if you do it during working hours in the council chamber or the public works uh, committee room, then you, there's no cost associated with it. No, exactly. Yeah. And let's share and learn from that. And then, then we'll do something and learn from others, both mistakes and things they've done well. Uh, turning to sources of energy today, these are no secrets, but, but it's worth noting. Uh, these are what our levelized costs are today for the different sources of power that we take. Uh, you would find uh, coal and natural gas in some sort of parity. You'd find wind about twice that, and you'd find solar about four times that. Uh, again, these are a point in time. These are reflective of, if you will, yesterday's costs or markets. Looking forward, we expect these to converge uh, as technologies get better, as there are scale efficiencies in renewables, and as the costs of emitting carbon uh, become borne either through regulation or other places we see in the environment. Uh, Investment, uh, this is a business where we make long-term investments. Again, this ties to the rate structure that we are hoping to work towards, which relies on a sensible forward-looking, and we will invest meaningful sums of money in infrastructure and regulatory compliance. Again, it's not just filling out forms uh, and our supply. Let me talk a little bit about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, last and most important. Um, again, just for the record, we have benefited at this department from very wise strategic decisions uh, folks made a generation ago. Uh, we have the most reliable system in the neighborhood and we provide the cheapest power in the neighborhood. And it's certainly my goal that a generation from now people will be sitting in a forum like this and thanking you and other policymakers for the wise decisions about where we make to go from here because we need to protect our comparative advantage which is cheaper and more reliable power. Great. Um, let me go. Oh, all right. I was going to say, should we go to the water side real quick? Yeah, go ahead. All go right. Ahead. All right. Four goals. I'll try and go more quickly. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm laboring this. Uh, again, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. I hope to see more pictures of our crews uh, with a street temporarily uh, torn up to replace riveted pipe as opposed to pictures of fire trucks parked in ditches. Uh, we'll maintain regulatory compliance on this side. Again, it's not just filling out forms. We actually spend real meaningful sums of monies. Uh, we need to increase our supply of local water, and again, we need to maintain cheaper rates for our customers. Uh, the centerpieces of the water plan, uh, we're going to get by with less than we had budgeted, so a 7% increase um, uh, for this year. A typical customer will see about a 3%. Um, uh, I don't like the magnitude of that, but it is from costs incurred and things we agreed to do many, many years ago in, to maintain a positive closed water pressure, positive pressure closed water system. You'll see in the context of what our neighbors have to do, this is actually far and away the lowest increase in the neighborhood. Again, the Van Nuys project, this department will benefit from since it's a joint facility. We will use the balance sheet of the water system also more effectively, uh, and we will share with you in detail the funds and the sources where we have cash today uh, that we can use as opposed to increasing rates. Infrastructure is the key here. Regulatory compliance, uh, for instance, in March of 2009 was the most recent. Uh, several were before. Uh, so the spending that we're doing this year and the 7.3% increase owes mostly to those regulatory agreements we entered two years ago. The water budget, uh, you've seen before in our prior presentation. Let me turn to infrastructure a little bit and just give you some highlights. Uh, this is an infrastructure intensive business. Our infrastructure is older than anyone in this room. And we're going to do a lot of boring stuff, increasing the rate at which we replace mainline, uh, replacing valves, meters, pump stations. Uh, and in the long term, groundwater cleanup is probably the centerpiece of what we need to do. In regulatory compliance, 
I'll touch on reservoir covers. It's a, a favorite of mine because it's kind of easy to understand. Uh, in order to have a positive pressure closed system, it means we have to cover our reservoirs. Historically, the department has done them one by one. So you get any particular uh, reservoir and you have the constituents who live around it to say, well, gosh, if you're going to cover it, it would be nice to have a park. So why don't you make it a bunch of cisterns, put it underground. Uh, and by the way, here's a fire warrant who will tell you public access to that park puts all of us at risk. Just to dimension a little bit, if we cover uh, with flexible covers, it's $35 million. If we cover it with undergrounding and turning it into parks, it's probably closer to $150 million per. Uh, so this is, again, one of those policy choices uh, that we need to better inform our constituents, better inform council so that we can look at it in aggregate. And we make choices. This is not a buffet. So if we've got $12 for dinner and we're spending eight of those $12 on reservoir covers, then we can't do the infrastructure that we need to do on the water side. And it's, it's difficult choices. I can appreciate any particular set of constituents, but I want to make sure we look at all six of those reservoirs in the context of our long-term cost structure as opposed to look at any individual one uh, where the choice may not be as informed. In terms of water supply, you'll see a long-term trend where we're using more water from MWD uh, than historic aqueduct sources. Uh, the reason for that is pretty simple. About half of the water remains now in the Owens Valley area by prior agreements, uh, meaning we're using it to do things uh, in that area that uh, by regulation or by agreement we've agreed to do that has a real cost we'll talk about in a moment. Our sources of supply, uh, historically Owens was our cheapest and best. Uh, it's about twice that cost now, in effect, because we leave half behind. And local groundwater is the cheapest, but we're limited by volume. You'll see recycled water, while expensive, becomes an important part of our plan over time. Just touching on two of the projects that are ongoing in the Owens Valley, we have cost. We leave about 100,000 acre feet of water to, in effect, sprinkle a dry lake. Uh, that costs us $70 million a year. We have spent cumulatively half a billion dollars for this one project. Again, this is one of those policy choices uh, where we need guidance, whether that's wise or not wise. We do have to be careful if we're not. Uh, someday we're going to be watering uh, Death Valley because people will say the dust has gone over the hill, and uh, that's also where we need to water. So we have to be very, very vigilant in making sure that we do our best uh, to maintain uh, the environment around us, but at the same time we have to be cognizant of cost. We're spending $70 million there this year and every year. In addition to the Lowen, Lower Owens River, it's a beautiful project. I've seen it. I was up there with our water team two weeks ago. We spend $16 million a year uh, on that rewatering project, um, and uh, that's a fixed cost for us. Local water strategies, I said, is probably the most important thing we're doing for our long-term supply. We'll spend about $100 million. Uh, recycle water, the purple pipe, uh, the centerpiece of that this year will be to complete the master plan. This is, a, in effect, a parallel system of spaghetti throughout our city one day because it emanates from where we treat water, not our traditional sources. So it's, it's, a, it's a totally new and parallel system. Uh, historically, we've picked off opportunities right next to treatment plants. Over time, we expect to send that water out to our industrial customers for commercial use, and it's a great source of water for us, uh, but it'll take some investment. Uh, we're increasing conservation investments. Uh, that is the highest returning investment on both sides. It also obviously has an environmental good. And we're going to continue with our groundwater cleanup. Long-term groundwater cleanup is essential to make sure we have that source of supply. You'll see we're going to spend almost $2 billion in the next 10 years on local supply. Again, this lessens the dependence on uh, third-party sources, in particular expensive water from the MWD. Uh, where the rubber meets the road on the water side, again, after the rollback, we'll be looking at about a system-wide 7% increase this year. Uh, that is principally driven by costs from regulation that we agreed to comply with years ago. Uh, in comparison with some of our neighbors, whether it's Burbank uh, uh, Newport Beach, we can say we're managing against these same regulations reasonably well, actually, uh, but 7% is not anything anybody likes. If we look at our monthly bills, uh, you'll see comparing ourselves, for instance, to our neighbors in Long Beach, uh, we're about 20 percent cheaper. I hope we can, by spending our money wisely, uh, maintain that cost advantage. On the rate structure, I mentioned the power side. Uh, simplifying rates will provide for, I believe, a more engaged discussion on where we're spending our money and for more informed customers. 
We intend to do the same thing on the water side. Uh, if anyone could explain to me their water bill, uh, they're far smarter than I. There's a lot of people who are. I don't understand mine. But just to give you some sense, before we implemented shortage year rates, tier two water, meaning excess use, was cheaper than tier one. So we have a system that doesn't work. Right now, two thirds of our water bill comes from all these different adjustments. No one can track, no customer understands. Again, we'll be proposing to our commission, again, coming to council to opine on, we'll be maintaining the same tier, so by geography and everything in our city, but at the same time, the only thing that should vary and not be part of race, base rates, going back to 80% of our charges and 80% uh, in base rate is purchase water, where we purchase water every year from ranchers or MWD. The market is what the market is. Uh, and there will need to be a volume adjustment because as we save, we use less units. Your bill will go down, but you may pay slightly more per unit. So the only two factors to be passed through are those which are totally beyond our control. Everything else should be approved by council, should be in the numbers and the budgets. Customer service, uh, we're going to invest in getting out of COBOL, the archaic software system we have. If we have a smart grid and a smart water system, we need a smart customer. This will pay dividends not only in communicating with our constituents and a more regular bill and an understandable bill, but this will allow our customers to better plan their needs, uh, to better shift use to different day parts and week parts, uh, and so a more overall efficient system. It'll pay off in less investment by us and less in cost to our customers. This is, again, an example of something where people have either hidden it or kicked it down the road. Uh, this $25 million in our budget, we will pay for it this year. It should have been paid for 10 years ago or 20 years ago uh, because these are necessary investments and tools to support our customers. On the ratepayer advocate, <clears throat> let me be clear on what our commitments are. As a department, we support the notion 110 percent, having an independent, informed body to opine on rate actions of the department is a good idea. We're committed to fund the people to do it. We're committed to fund the outside research they may need within bounds. And we are committed to provide timely and accurate information to make sure they can do their job. It is our recommendation today uh, that, at least to start, uh, the ratepayer advocate be placed in the CAO's office. Historically, that individual or that department is a neutral player between council and the mayor, uh, hopefully yeah. at least politicized. Over the long term, council may wish to have it elsewhere. Uh, what I don't want the department uh, to have to be burdened with or anyone in this room is delay. And so we'd like to start. If it turns out that council has a different view over time or any members well, of council wish to take yeah. it to the ballot yeah, to put it elsewhere, are. they can do that. You, you, this started before you got here. Right. Yeah, so, you, so you're clear and so the public is clear, whoever's listening in, that uh, this conversation about a rate payer advocate inspector general started uh, probably over a year ago, and uh, we're debating when to put it on the ballot uh, because we need to be cost effective and have enough on the ballot so that it, you know, it is not overly burdensome to the taxpayer. But uh, it is our intention to put it on the ballot. There has been numerous on the record discussions already. No one, absolutely, I don't think there is anyone who has any intention of putting it in the office of any elected official. So that was never on the table in any viable way. So just I think we're in accord on that uh, as to whether uh, the voters decide that it should stay in the office of the CAO. You know, obviously we'll be yeah, able no, to vote. I, I think yeah. you, we're saying the same thing. It would be our recommendation we get started there because having someone there is better than not having someone. And then over time, if if the rate payers or if our uh, if it's on the ballot and someone says they want somewhere else, great. We're happy yeah, to and then just so that you know, um, I think having a rate payer advocate and having it on the ballot and having people vote for it gives the department the opportunity, again, to have a huge leap in rebuilding confidence uh, with the ratepayer and the public because the public it has, has the opportunity to have a hand in shaping this uh, in the manner that they see fit. So uh, I, I imagine that once we make a decision on when it goes on the ballot, uh, I would predict that we wouldn't even have to raise a penny to campaign for it. That's how strong a reaction this will evoke. and that we put it in a, a neutral office, non-political office, is even better. Um, I know there is some, some discussion about uh, the CAO's office, and I think that's a good one to put on the table. 
uh, that and I had heard some discussion about asking the CAO to do it, which I personally think is a bad idea. He has his hands beyond full. I agree with you. And, uh, you know, he's only one person, and I don't think that's realistic. Uh, and so, you know, we'll, we'll continue this discussion. But just for the public who's listening, again, this is a long-term discussion, part of an overall charter reform uh, package, which includes the ratepayer advocate, the inspector general, uh, the appointment or a decommission of commissioners for the Department of Water and Power Commission, and the way that the general manager is uh, uh, retained or terminated, and that will all be on the ballot together as a package. Sure. Well, again, I, I, uh, I'm new to this. I don't have yeah, the history you do. That's why I want you to know. I'm not involved in the politics. Again, I want to be clear the department is willing to do this tomorrow, and I think that all the ratepayers would benefit by doing it tomorrow. Well, and I don't know that it's a matter of politics, and politics is not a pejorative term. Uh, you know, it, we are in the government. It's public. I would say that it's more that it's public participation and engagement, and I think it behooves all of us, and particularly the department. This is a good thing for the department. Uh, no, I, yeah. I think we're saying the same yeah. thing, but I, I as No, I mean, it's a good thing on the ballot, and then your effort here is a good first step to put it, put the department in a holding pattern with a ratepayer advocate till it goes on the ballot. It, it's, it, like I said, I just want to be clear, if we're in a holding pattern, it's yeah. the choice of others, not ourselves, because yeah, we would, we'd be delighted to begin today, and it could yeah. be revised over time. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last, just to summarize, uh, like any plan, this identifies priorities and the resource to pay for them. It is our uh, first cut at trying to identify uh, for all of you the issues we face. Uh, we have a strategy to redeploy some assets because in this environment, uh, in any environment, uh, the last place we should look to money is our ratepayers. <laughs> Uh, we have a plan to engage all of our stakeholders. We're here today voluntarily. This is not uh, something that's required of us, but I think it's useful to engage with your committee as often as we can. Yeah. Uh, we met yesterday with uh, customers as well as folks from the environmental community to explain this to them and solicit their input and questions. Again, we are recommending uh, the soonest practicable adoption of a ratepayer advocate to help in communicating what is going on. Uh, it is our goal to maintain lower rates, uh, and we shouldn't lose sight of that's the base from which we start. That's important. Uh, and we will continue our leadership position in transitioning to environmentally sustainable operations within the realm of what we can afford, and that's why we need to talk about that at the same time we talk about our budget. Again, um, okay, great. I want to ask you a couple of questions. and. Um, it may be, since we're out of time, that we can get the reports back before we let this out of committee, and you don't necessarily have to be the one to come back to do it. Okay. Um, uh, I need a report back, because I've asked this before. Um, the Debt Reduction Trust Fund, the second time that Mr. Garcetti and I went up to the commission and, and spoke about the uh, ECAF yeah. proposal, and there was a letter from Bond Council. Yeah. Which I think we read into the record. Uh, it might have been the Fitch letter. I can't recall. Which uh, yeah, I can't remember. I don't think it was Fitch, but. Could, could I suggest just a slightly different take on that? Because I, I want to make sure you you're, are looking at the, the information in context. We like to come back and show you working capital analysis because that includes not only the debt reduction trust fund, but right. unrestricted cash and other places' yeah. cash. No, 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 that's fine. Yeah. That's that's fine. But I want you to bring pull that letter for me again. Because uh, we read it into the record, so it should be pretty easy to find, right. because it kind of stated the mission, uh, the framework for the Debt Reduction Trust Fund. And, uh, you know, you can work with um, uh, Jeff Catalano and Rafael Prieto in advance of this so that we can have a global uh, picture. But what, I, what I, I want, finally, is a definitive statement on the record about how we can use the Debt Reduction Trust Fund and how we, how we cannot, what are, the, what are the limitations and what are the opportunities. Um, and I, I, wanted, I wanted a definitive answer to be able to put on the record. On the um, pipeline replacement program, if you can just give me a five to ten year uh, photograph, what's been done, what remains to be done, and uh, you know, if we can do it with bar graphs or whatever, I, Great. I don't we'll care, do GIS, whatever, just Good. so that we can show the rate pair, okay, this is where your money's been spent for the last five years, this is where we're going to spend it the next five years on pipe replacement. Will do. Um, then um, on the uh, power plan, I think you said we got a 5.3 increase in electric rates for 11, 12. 
And again, that's not a that that is a uh, target. That's target? not yet okay. budget. That's not approved. We've not been before our commission or this body to talk about that. But what we're trying to do, as we transition to everything in the base, is to be able to look out a little further because we think it helps our yeah, customers plan and this council to plan. So, as part of that, you know, obviously asset sales um, are, are part of that plan um, on the power side, um, and I think that in extrapolating you hope to sell maybe 150 million in uh, natural grass reserves and I want to know what that will do to the fuel portfolio mm -hmm. and if the department has to replace these reserves with power purchase agreements with other natural gas providers what we would do uh, we'll give you again when we present to our Commission for formal action we would replace the physical commodity with both a hedging program and a purchase strategy. We wouldn't be purchasing power, but just be purchasing those gas molecules uh, from others. Okay. And then uh, and the CLAs, and again, Jeff will work with your staff to come back with, I want something that's just really clear cut. Uh, the IRP for renewables first and the subsequent plan for financing that uh, I'd like to get a little more outline on the timelines on that and how we're working together uh, to be able to produce this IRP uh, in a consensus oriented way. Yeah, I, my, my suggest again, we will present that shortly. It will show all forms because as I mentioned, it's a little bit of a multivariate equation, right? We have to maintain base. We have to maintain certain things in our basin. Uh, we have to reduce carbon and we go down a renewable path. So we'll show you all those pieces at the same time. You can't just look at one in isolation. Oh, okay. Uh, the other quick, quick things, and I'll give you copies of the questions sure. so you don't have to copy them, um, and he'll transmit it uh, when you guys are working together. Uh, okay, so the department is looking for ways to mitigate rate impacts and obtain these green power objectives. I just wanted to know for the record, and we can dig a little deeper subsequent, has, has, uh, have you looked at operations and maintenance cost deferrals? Uh, and postponing capital upgrades? Well, uh, let's separate those two questions. As I mentioned in our budget, we have a top to bottom business review. So we're looking at supply chain management, uh, we're looking at our operating costs, uh, we're looking at our excess real estate and every policy and procedure we have to reduce costs during the year. Uh, an example of that is the $20 million we're saving on the computer information system in Van Nuys. We are not deferring capital investments because that would be unwise. And capital investments take the form of mainline replacement. They take the form of reliability investments on the power side. So what we're looking to do is trim our costs as aggressively as we can, and that's an ongoing exercise at the department. Okay, great. This uh, may be something that you want to do in a subsequent report, but uh, in reviewing your plan to simplify the power rate structure, uh, there's a proposal to decouple the two components, base rate and fuel pass-through. Um, and I think we need to demonstrate to the ratepayer where the RPS will go. And then, the, uh, just so you know, and I don't know whether you were here then, council sought to implement a um, discrete uh, renewable, renewable portfolio standard fee or charge that was really easy to identify and uh, was pretty transparent. Now, under this approach, this plan, uh, how transparent would that be? It would be equally transparent because the only thing that wouldn't be directly acted on by commission and directly acted on by this council is fuel, which will go up and down. We have to burn a certain amount to turn our generators on. So renewables will be a portion of the base rate and it will be clearly presented to our commission, to this council, and to our customers how much a portion of that base rate it is, but it's all within the base rate, so it's approved. Uh, and I think that's where things got off track before in that it was in some separate pass-through account. Uh, it was overspent. The account was overdrafted, if you will, uh, and then uh, chaos ensued. So I think putting things in a base rate where everyone, including you, have to opine on them, I think allows people engaged and informed and to say yes or no, we can afford to pay for that. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, just to close, uh, close up, um, again, in terms of building confidence, um, I, I think that if you look at the council as a pipeline 
uh, or a delivery system and a way for everybody to funnel their, their opinions, their, their insight, their input uh, for, through this public hearing format, not only through committee, but ultimately through council, uh, to develop this uh, oversight position that will go on the ballot. Uh, you know, I think we need to be extremely cautious about doing anything that indicates that the regulated entity is developing uh, the position itself. Um, and again, that's a nice placeholder, but we're going to have to work together on making sure that we force all, all of this to an external manner and make sure that we solicit as much as we can externally and uh, try to reflect that in the ballot language so that this passes without, without a doubt. Again, we, we support it. Uh, we will serve the needs of that ratepayer, and we just hope it's adopted soon. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, that's, uh, we have to get back downstairs in a minute. I do have one speaker card from Dr. Williams. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Dr. Williams, would you like to come up? Dr. Clyde Williams, 4115 Barrett Road, El Sereno, Northeast LA. I really appeal to the attorney. Was this on subject? I don't know. Yeah. Because this was the long-term strategy. It wasn't the budget that was passed yesterday by the Board of Water and Power. The long-term strategy has different numbers mm -hmm. than those in the budget. Mm -hmm. So this, this is just uh, one part. Hmm? This is just one. We're not done. We're not done. I hope not. No, we're not done. Don't worry. And this long-term strategy, which is sometimes called a strategic plan by some people, is not a strategic plan. Huron worked on a strategic plan for two years. What happened to it? We're now looking at a totally different thing. There's also a, a large number of elements in here. The pass-through is, might say, substituting for the adjustment factors. The pass-through, however, is specifically identified as uncapped. And what will be included in it? Mm -hmm. Will feed-in tariffs be included in it? Will other things, secondary things, be included in it? Just like in the ECAF? We don't know. And that's one of the things. This is a real snow job. Yesterday it was distributed at 7 a.m for a 1230 meeting. So, I don't know. At least we got a hard copy today. There were no hard copies available yesterday. So everybody had to have it online, mm. unless you were in DWP. So is this transparency? Mm -hmm. How'd you get yours? Hmm? How did you get yours? How, How did you get yours yesterday? I got it this morning. Oh, you got it this morning, okay. Not yesterday. Okay. So this is at 7 a.m. I got it yesterday by email. So there's a question as transparency, mm -hmm. public participation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on, and there are differences between the budget yeah. that was passed and this. So. I understand. And like I said, we're not done. This is just the first cut, and we're just going to have to keep digging deeper and linking the two and understanding the differences. But the budget for DWP has to be in place mm -hmm. July 1. Mm -hmm. Gotta hurry. Thank you. All right, uh, for matters that aren't on the agenda, this is the time for public comment. Uh, anybody who wishes to make public comment should come forward now. Otherwise, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>